Good morning. Hi, Kevin. Hello. Good morning. This is James Stanford with City of McAllister. I'm actually calling you on the road. I'm in the uh, driving back to McAllister from Oklahoma City. Okay. The others should be joining in a moment. All right. Since I was driving, I went ahead and started the meeting and just set my phone down and just waited for it to connect.
resuming call. Hello, Ian. Hey, good morning. This is uh, Jim Vidmar. I look at but it says Jim Craig, but I had to log in as Jim to get things going. But uh, I should have the uh, share screen turned on for both you and Kevin. So uh, okay. here in a couple of minutes, Tamara Pratt is going to kick things off for us. Yeah, sounds good. Now, you're not uh, over there sharing passwords, are you, Jim? <laughs> no, I'd never do that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, great. Well, I'm ready to go uh, whenever y'all are. So okay, Tamara is here, but uh, we thought we'd wait a couple more minutes to see mm -hmm. if a few more folks pop in. Absolutely. <clears throat> Morning, Britt.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Oklahoma Environmental Training Center's somewhat less formal webinar on Zoom called Hacking Your Water Today. Uh, we want to thank you for devoting the next hour to this very important topic. As presented through Rose State College, I'm Tamara Pratt, the Vice President of External Affairs here at the college, and I'll be your moderator for the next hour. We have wonderful speakers on deck today to share their experiences and knowledge. This, of course, is in response to the water system attack in Florida, Florida about a month ago. Uh, as many of you already know, a hacker remotely accessed the water supply in Oldsmar, Florida, and was able to change the amount of sodium hydroxide in the water. Luckily, an employee saw the changes and made corrections immediately. No harm came to the public. But of course, this doesn't diminish the, the issue or the need for more awareness and uh, education around the issue. Our first presenter is Ian Anderson. He is with og &E in the capacity of Manager of Enterprise Security. Ian is a frequent speaker at the OWPCC conference on cybersecurity issues, and today he'll be talking about industrial control systems, so we're very excited to have him. Our second presenter is Kevin Owens, Chief Technology Officer for Control Cyber Incorporated. Kevin serves as a member on the Standards Board for the American Water Works Association, and he'll be looking at the American Water Infrastructure Act of 2018 and why it matters here in Oklahoma to all of us. So our chat room is open. I hope that you, uh, as you have thoughts, feedback, questions, you're gonna utilize that chat feature. And at the end of our presentations, we'll be opening it up for Q&A with both our speakers and utilize your questions from that chat. So without further delay, let's begin our program with Ian Anderson of OG&E. Ian? Yeah, thank you so much for the, the kind introduction, Tamara. Um, Good morning, everyone. My name is Ian Anderson. I'm a manager of enterprise security at OG&E. Um, specifically, I focus on cybersecurity operations. And at OG&E, that means um, an integrated approach to cybersecurity. So we use IT, OT, cloud, all of it all falls within the realm of our enterprise security team. And today, or Tamara asked me to come talk a little bit about uh, the events at Oldsmar, Florida. Um, just a quick you know, background on me, I spent a few years working for the city of Oklahoma City. I was uh, involved with the Oklahoma City water utility, uh, the water side, wastewater a little bit, transmission distribution, all that good stuff. Um, and so now in my current uh, capacity at og and &E, I've gotten to see kind of both, both sides of utilities, uh, the electric side, the heavily regulated side uh, that uh, electric has, and then the less regula regulated side that water has. <clears throat> now, with the events of Oldsmar, Florida, you know, a lot of us are kind of looking for, you know, the, the doom and gloom of the water environment. And I'm actually here to tell you, um, I'm very confident in our water capabilities. But as Tamara said, um, this, it, it doesn't take away from the need to talk about security, especially with industrial control systems. And I know a lot of organizations are starting to get more and more interested and defending their industrial control systems and bringing IT services and capabilities to bear. So I'm gonna uh, walk through a presentation that I gave at B-Sides Boston last year talking about why fancy tools aren't going to save us and really the path to industrial control system security is through relationships. So um, let me just share my screen. All right, can everyone see my screen? Okay, I got, I got a thumbs up from one of the gyms. So I think we're good to go. All right, so I gave this presentation. It's what stickers, donuts, and listening can do for your ICS security program. Uh, our agenda for today is uh, we're gonna talk about the problem with tools. So right now, cybersecurity is very focused on, do you have this tool? Do you have that tool? Like we collect tools like they're baseball trading cards. Um, and then what do we actually do with them? Well, there's a lot of challenges there. We're going to uh, then hit why relationships matter, and then we'll follow up with some tips and tricks that we have done over, you know, that I've done over the course of my career to improve ICS security in a measurable, tangible way that uh, that provides for long-term success. So, just a quick disclaimer: I'm an I'm a cybersecurity guy. I'm not a process guy, uh, and I recognize that, and I think that's actually turned into one of my superpowers that. I can go into a plant, I can go into a facility and be comfortable not having a clue what the heck I'm looking at or understanding it, right? Um, it's an approach that has served me well and I, I think it serves others well when you go into someone else's domain and then you realize that you're a tour, tourist and we're, we'll talk a little bit about that. So 
As a cybersecurity manager, here is an eye chart that I am regularly faced with. So this is the list of different vendors that are out there offering tools to solve my security problems. But you know the old saying, mo tools, mo problems. Because you cannot ask any organization, even one that is you know fairly well funded like og e or even large organizations to take this eye chart and say, okay, now here, go build a security program from it. Because now I have to figure out not only what all these individuals do, uh, organizations do, how they differ from each other, how they then fit into each other, and then how do they actually go solve real tangible business problems that I have, right? If we are pursuing something beyond checkbox security, we cannot just be an organization focused simply on deploying more and more stuff, right? So <clears throat> there is this little box here on the top left because it's a new category that's kind of starting to get hot these days, and that's ICSOT. <clears throat> now, several years ago, there was only probably three or four of these companies, but now they're starting to grow. And so, you know, some of the big players like, uh, you know, Dragos is certainly one of the top, in my opinion. You have Nozomi, you have Clarity. Shoot, CyberX actually went out and uh, got purchased by Microsoft. And they Microsoft has recently announced that they are folding CyberX's product into the into their IoT security offering. Now, IoT is very different than ICS, but we do see this kind of uh, this this pivot by larger vendors to say, "Hey, there's this whole world of computing out there that I do not currently have any sort of solution around." And so we're seeing these smaller OT companies get bought up and then repurposed for things maybe even outside of the the traditional OT landscape. So. We go back here and we say, wow, there is just so much And this, you know, I grab a new copy of this every single year. Uh, in fact, this is now version 2.5 of this eye chart and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so <clears throat> the true takeaway, in my opinion, is there is no tool coming to save us. We cannot rely upon security vendors. We cannot rely upon security technologies to solve. It doesn't mean we can't use them to help us, but we cannot rely on, upon them to solve our problems. So if we're truly going to build a defensible industrial control system environment, what do we need to do? Well, first off, we need to stop trying to imprint our IT processes and thoughts into an OT environment because they are very different in a lot of ways, in a lot of meaningful ways. Um, we need to actually maybe pivot and say, okay, instead of trying to make OT look like IT, what, what are some of the things about OT that uh, make it different, that make it more defensible? So I, I've seen this time and time and time again. An OT shop, you know, uh, you have plant owners, manufacturing lines, whatever, their job is to produce X widget. If you're at og &E, that could be we're generating electrons and shipping them to your house. If you're at a factory, it's producing, you know, a component or a product. You know, if you're at a refinery, it's making gas. It's, you know, those are the processes that actually matter because that's the product the company sells. Anything that you do to disrupt or hurt that process is going to take away from the value of security. So for instance, you know, we're here to talk about water, right? If cybersecurity comes in and hurts the ability for a water treatment plant to produce water and get it into the clear well and then off into the system, then security is going to be a threat to the water system itself. And if that's how we're being, you know, good luck getting people to, you know, to advocate and, and allow you to come into their environment. OT has been around for a long, long time. 20, you know, it's routine to see servers, PLCs, you know, RTUs, all these different devices in an OT environment that have been around for 10, 15, 20 years. I, I think some of them can now buy alcohol at, at a lot of plants. Um, and what's great about the OT folks is they have as long a memory as the age of their equipment. And what I mean by this is, um, I was working at the city of Oklahoma city and I made a reference to, Hey, like how, how about we patch this or upgrade this or whatever. And the OT guy, the operator looked at me and says, you know, that's pretty brave coming from a group that can't even figure out how to keep my email server up. And I'll tell you like that one cuts deep because they're right. I mean, how many outages has it caused over time? 
and they remember it. Any sort of outage directly and negatively impacts their service offering. Plant managers are typically paid by uptime or like they have incentives to, to maintain uptime. So any threat to that is going to, you know, is, is going to be a problem. Um, IT security, uh, we often like to fill the gaps, um, but OT is different. OT, it doesn't necessarily, um, you know, how to explain this? OT doesn't, isn't as extensible or at least not yet, because remember, we're trying to pour security into environments that have been around for a long, long time. And so while security kind of likes to nudge itself in between different systems, different you know, parts of the environment, OT doesn't necessarily lend itself to being as easily malleable as like an enterprise environment. And I think a lot about this statement that came from the Industrial Control System Cyber Kill Chain. It was written by uh, Mike Asante and Rob Lee. And Mike Asante, rest in peace, he's a wonderful and amazing man, did a lot for our community. But they wrote this seminal paper about saying, what does it take to attack a in industrial control system? And they, they turned the discussion to what are the benefits of OT? And this line, uh, by an understanding the inherent advantages of a well-architected industrial control system network, and by understanding adversary attack campaigns against ICS, security personnel can see how defense is doable. What, the take, what, what that really means is use some of the features of ICS itself against the attackers. ICS is very static. ICS is well known. ICS is typically monitored 24-7, far more than enterprise environments. There's a lot of positive going on in OT. But we allow things like the Oldsmar Florida um, event to say, oh, you know, IT is in danger. Critical infrastructure is in danger. And I categorically reject that. You know, the Oldsmar Florida thing, you know, I, think the, I think the biggest danger that can come from the Oldsmar Florida event is that we try to simplify security in OT environment and do a little bit of um, asset owner shaming. Because yes, was a mistake made? Sure. How long had that mistake existed? Well, where, where was IT? Where was the organization, right? I mean, it, it all just kind of falls upon the asset owner there at the end of the day. And I don't know if that's necessarily fair because the asset owners have very different um, goals in terms of making sure that their systems stay up. So, so you notice I tried, you know, we're trying to, uh, you know, talk about what are, what are the different roles that exist here? Um, you know, you very much have to approach IT or OT security as a team sport. So you need IT in there because frankly, you know, these OT environments are no longer part of isolated or air-gapped environments. They are very much a part of the larger ecosystem and environment of you know, the organization or at times interconnectedness with other entities. So you have to have IT. You have to have OT because again, they're the ones that actually know what's going on and why these things matter and how things actually work. And then management has to be very involved because that's where resources come from. IT and OT don't decide how much money you're going to spend on personnel or tools or any of the things that you need to create this defensible environment. Management does that. So if you don't have an active and engaged management that's interested in security, you're already behind the power curve. So, but I want us to really focus more on how do we start to develop relationships with OT? Because at the end of the day, if OT is uncomfortable with you bringing in some of your services capabilities or just your presence alone, you're going to have a bad time. So what can we do as resource, I don't want to say poor, but you know, resource restricted uh, entities that can start to do, uh, develop relationships and partnerships that can be leveraged to, to build more defensible environments? Well, first off is field trips. And I know this sounds silly, but this is one of the most important things that we do. And in fact, this is probably one of the most negative impacts we've had via COVID. I cannot send my teams out to the plants now easily. And we would monthly go out to the plants if only to say hi, if only to drop some stuff off. And I've got some other cool things that we do um, here in a little bit, but God, get out of your office, go see the folks out at the, the facility. Um, when I worked at the city of Oklahoma City, driving up and down the Otoko pipeline, I got more information and intelligence from those dudes out in the field than I would have ever gotten sitting downtown. So get if you are interested in OT, got to get to where the users are. So if you're going to go out there, though, be mindful they have day jobs. 
So is the plant in an outage? Is, you know, is there something going on? Is there construction going on? Are there, you know, is it a good time? Be very conscious that when you show up, you are a tourist. And even if you're no longer a tourist, you're certainly a visitor and you create, you can create problems for the OT folks because they kind of have to manage you once you're there. So you know, some of these environments are very dangerous and that safety is a, uh, a primary goal of theirs. So making sure that you show up in a way where you're sitting, you know, the conditions are safe, that they have time, that you're not creating a burden just by being there. So um, the reverse works as well. So uh, uh, we security guys tend to go to some conferences from time to time. Um, there is a amazing OT security conference in Miami, Florida in January. And I'll tell you, uh, it's called S4. And I highly recommend you go in if you, you know, if you can get the funding and stuff, there's so much good information. Um, but a pure power move, bring one of your OT folks with you. So we did this with one of our plant managers. And now guess what? We got a buddy. We got a buddy that's in the plant that can help us understand problems that we see, can help us connect with the right people. It was such an easy lift for us to just get one more body uh, out there. And I'll tell you, no one's going to turn down Miami in January. Um, uh, so, and it's beyond security. Like one of the things I really love about OT and our folks out in the field is that, you know, it's way more than just like a nine to five grind. Like our linemen are out there, like when a storm happens or an event happens, our linemen get out there and they, they work their butts off and try, to try and get people's power back. They are a really proud and amazing collection of people. I'm blessed to get to know them. And they do so much stuff beyond just computing. And so one of the things that we do is we try to get involved with stuff that they got going on. So this image that you have is our annual lineman rodeo. It's when all the different linemen come up and they compete against each other. And what do we do there? We don't pitch security. We basically run one of these little booths that you see here on the right. We hand out candy and let their kids shoot Nerf guns. We have our enterprise security banner so they know who we are, but we don't, we, you know, it's not a security thing. This is them. This is their event. We're just there to support them. And so what we do in this is we start to normalize just our presence in a way that, you know, in a good way. Like we want to build this positive image attribution. Not only like they're kind of fun, fun events, but we participate in things like um, uh, the uh, confined space um, uh, training and stuff that they do. So each plant has a confined space rescue team and they, they get together and do training and, and compete against each other. And we're there too, in almost identical capacity. We're there just to be their friends, to hang out, to, you know, be, you know, just be present. Again, we want them to see our faces and not groan because, oh God, it's cybersecurity. Um, so, so what are some other things that we do? Um, again, we try to extend ourselves outside of just, uh, just cybersecurity. So we hold an annual cyber or uh, annual kind of conference to bring some of these people together. And we do things like we'll bring the Oklahoma Highway Patrol uh, bomb dogs out. And then we'll invite them, you know, we'll invite the guys out and uh, OHP will actually blow up some stuff for us. And uh, you want to get, you want to get field guys interested in what you're doing, promise them explosives and they will, they will definitely show, show out for that. So I think this is probably one of our top uh, <laughs> attended functions that we've ever done. So, and, uh, and another benefit of this is we have now created a partnership with Oklahoma Highway Patrol. So if there's ever any sort of bomb or any sort of problem at one of our facilities, it's not the first time these dogs have been around there or the officers. And so we feel that we can respond better to a crisis because we've done a little bit of legwork up front. Okay, so now to the really fun part. When you go out, when you meet with these guys, bring donuts. Bring donuts. I mean, it is such a simple, easy thing. A dozen donuts costs you like 10 bucks, maybe. You bring a box of donuts, I promise you people will be happy. And you leave these donuts in the break room and you don't ask for anything else. You don't say, hey, I'll give you this if you promise to quit using USB drives. No, no strings attached. You're just there to be their partner. But remember, donuts are good for break rooms. Donuts are not good for control rooms or, or trucks. So what we do is we buy big old bags of candy. 
And here's a true pro move. Start remembering what plant and what operator likes what candy. Because you know, when someone shows up with something you really like and it makes you feel so special, what does that do for your relationship? Right? It sends it through the roof. And so we, we kind of keep a list of like, hey, so-and-so operator is, you know, is on shift today and we're going out there. So we better bring a bag of Twizzlers. And it's almost like a Pav uh, Pavlov's dog reaction when we show up and they see like the candy in hand and they get excited. I'm telling you, if you have operators that are excited to see you, then you're winning. Because when they're excited to see you, they will share all sorts of stuff that's going on. And as a security guy, oh, that's really good to know. I can go fix some things. I can go help them. I can remove roadblocks. There's a lot of power I can do. Um, and also a little kind of fun, quick uh, story about these puppy dog donuts. So we get one of these weird donuts each time we go out and we, no, none, none of these linemen or operators want to take the puppy dog donut just because they don't want to get made fun of. Um, but what we do is we bring like a Yeti cup or, you know, some really nice piece of swag we've gotten and we give that to the, whoever has the guts to take the puppy dog donut. Right. And so it turns into a reward and a joke and like it just it has this kind of like self feeding effect, you know, uh, in terms of your relationship with the entire group. So um, uh, I'll finish uh, this slide up on swag uh, stuff we all get. So if you are an IT person, you know all about swag. If you're a security person, you really know about swag. You go to a conference, you're just like they dump it on you. Um, guys out of the plants don't get that they don't get the cool security stuff sometimes. So we always say, just give me a whole box of swag. And uh, then we take it out to the plants and like, we give it, just give it to them, right? I, I don't need any more Splunk t-shirts, I promise. Um, but one of the things that, um, so, so we've actually built that philosophy into our deals where we um, say, hey, we're gonna buy a product or renew a service. Have your marketing team throw in a box of swag and just include that in it, and they will happily do it. Like that's that's what they do. So you get a box of swag to give out. You get get a tool. Everyone wins. Okay, um, kind of starting to wrap up. We're big on coins. I know a lot of organizations are uh, are big on coins. Coins are something that we've used uh, that OGE uses a lot. So each year we have a safety coin that we hand out and it's just a reminder. In fact, I actually have mine right here. I always keep it with me. So I've got my safety coin. It's a reminder of how important safety is. Uh, everyone has the right to get to go home at the end of the day in the same condition that they, they came to work in. So we're very, very, very serious about safety. And so we wanted to extend some of that thought uh, in cybersecurity. So we started looking at some other coins that we, we knew about. Um, you have the beer ice sack, which is always kind of a fun one. Um, at the city of Oklahoma City, we did a coin that we would hand out to people that did an extraordinary job. And then at OGE, we also have a coin. So these coins are just like these fun little tokens of appreciation. When you see something good, you can hand a coin. And that coin will sit on their desk or in a rack or something. And what always happens is someone will say, hey, where'd you get that coin? And then it becomes a competition. And then they want to partner as well. Okay, now to probably the, the, main, the main part of my uh, presentation, and uh, I'll try and wrap this up as quickly as I can because I know I'm about, uh, about out of time. Uh, talent development is one of the most important and hardest things uh, that we do in cybersecurity. So uh, make sure that you are looking at your current personnel and finding opportunities to start developing talent both ways. Take your OT folks, Train them up on IT security. Give them opportunities to learn and expand. IT folks, if they're interested in OT, nurture that, right? Going outside and hiring, you know, uh, third-party OT security Sorry. stuff is hard because there's just not a ton of people that do it. Uh, the numbers are getting better, but we're still a ways away. And don't, uh, don't, don't be afraid to deputize people in terms of like giving them access to your security tools if you are a security person. It makes them, it makes those people better with knowledge. Um, oops. little reminders, um, you know, we talked a little bit about, uh, stickers and swags. Um, we do mouse pads, we do desk mats. Um, we don't do it a ton because we just don't have a ton of money for that kind of stuff, but we even do little things like we color the, uh, secu the cables that run our security tools, a separate color than everything else. Because if you go out to one of our plants, 
you'll see a run of ethernet cable, but only one of those cables will be green. And what that means is that's security. And green is uh, uh, correlates with one of the vendors that we use, but it is just like one of those simple little reminders that security is always there. And I think that that's, that helps with our communication. Um, some pitfalls that I've seen in the past, uh, one, be aware of transactional relationships because you, your operators, just anyone you work with is going to see how empty and vapid those relationships are. If you have to have something in return for something, then like that's, that's purely transactional and you will not develop long-term trust. Face-to-face -face is always better than phone calls and phone calls are always better than emails. It's hard to do with COVID, but that is, that's the order that you need to focus on. Get your FaceTime in with these people. They're human beings and relationships are developed face-to-face. -face. Remember that memories last as long as ICS systems do. If you break them, if you hurt their process, they're gonna remember. And I've been a part of a security team that, you know, we've had, uh, we've had, uh, we've, we've performed a, a scan and it had negative impact on some PLCs and we still catch, catch, ha uh, um, catch hell for it from time to time. So they don't forget, they shouldn't forget because this is their livelihood. And none of this is a sim uh, simple function. It takes time to earn credibility. However, the payout is tremendous. So first things first, they return your calls. If you get people returning your calls, you're winning. They show up to your events, you're winning. They smile when you show up, you're winning. These are all the things that we need because what we really need is people to let us know when things get weird. We want to be one of the first folks that they call when things get weird, when things get hard. And by driving the re uh, relationship aspect, we get that. So if we were to try to tie this back to the old Smart Florida, if IT had a strong relationship with OT, they were likely going to be aware at some level of what kind of remote access technology are you using? But since they likely didn't have a relationship and I can't speak for them, um, they probably that's why they probably didn't know because like that's a whole separate world. And they said, well, that's OT's problem. Well, no, it's, it's all of our problems. So drive relationships, and, uh, and I promise you good things will come for your ICS security program. Um, so thanks. Ian, thank you so much. This has been very, a very interesting perspective that I wasn't quite anticipating and I really like it. Well, focusing on the human factor because we have humans running our systems and we can't forget that with all of the high technology that's available to us that it still comes back to people. And that, that's only built by if I have a French friend, if I'm a friend with you and I eat your dog donut, bottom line. So appreciate it. Moving on to our next uh, presenter is Kevin Owens. I gave you a little brief descriptor of Kevin's background. I'm not going to reiterate it again, but let's just say he's had a, he's been very busy lately. You may have already seen him on channel nine most recently, and um, he certainly has a national presence. So Kevin, I will be quiet and let you begin. Thanks, Tamara. So uh, one of the big things that we're here to he listen about is OEA, America's Water Infrastructure Act of 2018. So there was a, a big shift in focus to an all hazards approach, looking at not just natural disasters like floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, but also looking at physical and cyber attacks. So if we look back a little bit with history, uh, back in November, 1941, Hoover saw that water was critical to the nation's economy and how vulnerable it was. And he published this in the America Water Works Journal in November. And the following month was the attack on Pearl Harbor. The attack in Oklahoma City that you probably all remember it back in 1995, that led to a presidential directive focused on protecting critical infrastructure. After the attacks in 2001, there was the Bioterrorism Act of 2002 that came out requiring a vulnerability assessment of drinking water, but it was one and done. Do it and then move on. So after the devastation of Hurricane Katrina, then they started to get 
malware focused on control systems. One of those was Stuxnet in 2010. And then there was an attack on a water system in the United States in, that was reported by Verizon in 2016, which led to the updating of the Bioterrorism Act, OEA. So looking at that update, section 2013 of that act takes the vulnerability assessment and moves it to a greater risk and resilience assessment. Going from terrorism or an intentional act to all hazards. In the old Bioterrorism Act, you would submit your vulnerability assessment to the EPA. Now they just want to see that you send a letter that it was done. Emergency response plan. Now, again, they just want to see that you've updated it and submitted a letter to the EPA. So compliance deadlines, we're already halfway through. So the larger cities have already accomplished this. We're halfway through the medium sized ones. And now it's the smaller cities of which there are a lot, uh, over 8,000 across the country in this size of 3,300 to 50,000. One of the big changes is this cybersecurity threat. So back in the old days, you know, it was a very isolated system, control systems. I was building these over 25 years ago, very isolated system. But as technology changed, people wanted to start having access to that data. And so now that, that perimeter fence line is no longer the edge once you have that connectivity, because that connectivity is gonna increase your exposure because everybody wants access to that data. They wanna see how much power are people using? How can I bill for it? How much water are people using? How can I bill for it? So, uh, and you look at how quickly a compromise takes. A compromise of a computer can usually occur in mere minutes or less. Here we've got most uh, compromises took place um, in just minutes, and only 3% are discovered as, quick, as quickly. Most of them are not discovered for months or, and many times that's six months to a year before they actually notice a, a presence. There are lots of standards and guidance that are out there. Um, AWWA creates a lot of these in conjunction with uh, ANSI. So G430 looks at security practices. So security practices for your overall company. What is the culture? How are you taking security? As Ian was talking, how are you, are you taking it? Is it part of your culture? J100 is the risk and resilience assessment. And it kind of walks you through those steps. G440 has to do with emergency preparedness. And these first two are actually in compliance with the DHS Safety Act, which actually protects you for a liability insurance if you're attacked by a nation state actor. There's other um, guidance that's, that's out there for free. Uh, all these things you can find on awwa.org, but some guidance on uh, cybersecurity, process control systems, as well as a cybersecurity assessment tool. Uh, I helped design that. It's available on their website for free. And you can go through and look at all these things. Look at connections between your IT and OT side. Do they exist? How are they protected? How are they secured? So when you go through this, Phase one, you start looking at where are we at right now? So you start digging out your policies and procedures. Do things like that exist? And you start performing that, that gap analysis. 
creating an asset inventory is very helpful to understand what are my important critical assets and how can I have a baseline and restore some of these, especially after like a ransomware attack. So now we're looking at the risk and resilience assessment. So some of the things that a utility has to assess is looking at malevolent acts and natural hazards. So again, that's that all hazards approach. We're looking at resilience of the pipes, physical barriers, source water, that's a very important thing. Water collection and intake, pretreatment, treatment, storage, everything that has to do with it. But also the thing that most people don't understand is electronic computers and automated systems and connections to IT, that gets uh, important to be assessed and looked at. What are the monitoring practices of the system? And that's more than just water quality. That's also your cybersecurity, your incident detection uh, systems. Financial infrastructure. In the event that happened in 2016, there was a theft of customer data. 1.5 million customer accounts, their financial data was taken. These are people who do automatic payment every month. So your name, your address, your credit card, or your banking information, all that was grabbed. So that's why the AWEA, they're looking at what's the financial infrastructure of the system. And many times that's not the water guy's domain. So that's a separate system in the IT side, probably in the city system intertwined with a number of other systems. It's important to look at that. Looking at uh, storage handling of various chemicals by the system. Do you have chlorine? Is it liquid? Is it gas? And um, so there's a number of tools that are out there. Uh, again, here's a, a list of some of the different standards and some of the associated manuals that go with it, as well as a number of other guidances like this, I mentioned the cybersecurity guidance and assessment tool, as well as water, uh, WARN, which is the Water and Wastewater Agency Response Network. So the J100 process, it's a seven step process of going through, looking at your assets. What are my critical assets? What are the threats against those ads, assets? What are the consequences if something were to occur? Is it gonna to lead to injuries, fatalities? Is my system gonna be offline for a period of time? Uh, vulnerability analysis. So these critical assets, how are they being protected? What weaknesses exist, whether that's in the facilities, whether it's in policies or procedures or personnel behavior. And then threat analysis, here's where we look at what's the likelihood of these events happening. You know, if you're in uh, Kansas, Odds are very low that you're gonna have a hurricane. So now you don't have to worry about hurricanes. And then risk and resilience management is the last step. And here's where we're looking at and balancing those costs and understanding is there a net benefit or cost ratio? That's where we're doing those calculations. Now I mentioned source water earlier looking at the source water and seeing if there's events that could infect it are important. Whether that is a flood or uh, it could be the complete opposite, a drought, like the Oklahoma drought back in 2012. I mentioned Warren earlier, there's uh, agreements that you can make, especially if you are a smaller water community system to help if you don't have enough resources, if you don't have enough people, how can I interconnect 
or have agreements for people, for equipment, if an emergency were to occur. There's other guidance for a tribal water systems, as well as interstate. So if you are alongside a border, perhaps in Oklahoma, is there a connection into Texas that you have to worry about, for instance? And so there are a lot of these different standards that I talked about, and they all interrelate with each other. It's also important to look at physical security. What are the access points into that building? What are the access points into that equipment that's out in the field? What are the approaches? And, and are there any cameras that are in use or any intrusion detection if somebody opens up a cabinet out in the field? Looking at the architecture review, seeing where those connection points are, whether that's remote connections, like what happened in Oldsmar, or whether that's connections into the IT enterprise systems. So you have the uh, risk and resilience. So you've looked at all your risks and you start looking at what are the ways to protect against it and do those things balance out. And so in the end, you have a report and you look at those vulnerabilities and you figure out these are the priority one ones that I need to fix these at a bare minimum. Priority two, these are gonna have significant and immediate increase, but I'm not gonna do these till I knock off priority one. These are gonna cost me a little bit more in time, resources, money, Priority three, now we're looking at, I'm really trying to increase uh, cybersecurity in both the enterprise and ICS networks. And priority four, this is if you're protecting against a nation state. You will have knocked off all the other priorities here. So odds are many of you won't get to this unless you are in one of those critical places where your customer is one of those critical needs. Phase three, we're looking at the emergency response plan. So based on what we find in the risk and resilience assessment, you need to develop and update that emergency response plan. So you wanna look at ways that you can improve the security and resilience of that system. Is there ways that you can detect that event faster or better? Do you have plans and procedures in case of some of these events that you have brought up in your risk and resilience assessment that need to be addressed? They weren't in your plan. How can you do that? Because you're looking at ways to lessen the impact of that event. So, in the end, you have to uh, put a certification letter into the, to the EPA, which has your uh, community water system ID number, the date that it was certified, and whether you were doing a review, updating, or revision of your risk and resilience assessment or your emergency response plan. Now, I know you're saying, well, what happens if I don't do these things? Well, under um, the utility is subject to enforcement by the EPA and for each letter, they can fine a penalty of $25,000 per day, both for if you never did the RRA or you never did the ERP, each of those is a $25,000 fine per day. Now, again, that is up to. So looking at those compliance deadlines, as I said earlier, we are in the midst of those 8,000 plus systems across the country right now. If you are a smaller water utility, like the numerous rural water uh, systems across Oklahoma, 
even though you do not have to submit something to the EPA, it is still a very, very good idea to go through some of these things, look at some of these things and address it. Because if something were to happen, you you can't easily look upstream and say, hey, can you help me out? Because if you've got problems, they most likely have problems as well. So that's the wrap up. Um, we've got time now for some, some questions. Sorry, I went through that a little fast. I was just trying to make it so that we had some uh, time at the end. Kevin, while we're waiting for the chat to fill, I have a question and this, you know, the old rule of, of lawyering, you never ask a question you don't know the answer to. And I'm openly admitting, I don't know the answer to this question. But okay. based on your experience, I mean, this is what you do for a living. You help people um, with these issues in, in the utility sector. How prepared is Oklahoma from a utility perspective? And, and we're ignoring Ian and OG&E and people like that. We're, we're talking about those smaller, um, smaller rural areas, which we know are, are prevalent in Oklahoma. Um, unfortunately, uh, so I've, I've been looking at these systems for uh, uh, um, over, over 20 years. And the systems that I've assessed, 100% uh, of the water systems uh, have had malware present on it in one form or another. The only ones that haven't is the systems were completely isolated or they were brand new and were not turned online yet. Um, but uh, I have seen um, malware present on, on way too many systems. And you have to understand the smaller water utility systems, it's not their fault. Uh, they, they lack a lot of the resources. You know, for the cities, they are one of the the leading sources of income you know because they're putting bills out to everyone every month but then that gets put back into the city coffers and divided up first you know fire and and the police get their chunks and then you've got so you go down and oh we got to give some money to the water and wastewater area so uh you know, getting funding for some of these organizations is difficult. There are some resources that are available, especially if you are trying to buy equipment. So if you are trying to purchase like backup generators, there's actually funding for that. Uh, the uh, USDA is, is one resource for funding. They had over a billion dollars of unused money last fiscal year because no one tapped into it and asked for it. Yeah. Um, doing cybersecurity assessments, there's not a lot of funding for that, but there's things that you can do. And that's why going through some of those resources, many of them that are, are freely available, go through these things, try and check these things on your own. Well, I want to thank you both. Ian, do you have a comment? Because you're, I, I see you put, you popped your face back up. So that makes me think you have something to say. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, what Kevin's talking about, it's, it's interesting. You know, like the, the big difference between the electric utility space and the water utility space is we are heavily regulated um, in, in all things, and especially around NERC SIP. So we have a, uh, you know, uh, a reliability org organization, which is NER NERC, the North American um electric reliability corporation then we have our regional entities and all that stuff and we have a set of standards the NERC SIP standards that if we do not comply with we face fines and uh, those fines have real teeth so 2019 Duke Energy is one of the larger electric utilities in the nation was fined 10 million dollars for having poor cybersecurity. now to date and Kevin please correct me if I'm wrong but I don't think that there's any sort of like mandated required standards for water systems in terms of cybersecurity. And that being the case, like the true challenge is how do you get funding for something that isn't required? And I think the other, the, like the, the scarier challenge is what happens when an event creates enough of a political 
enough political awareness saying, hey, why don't we make elect water look like electric? Because they're very different in a lot of very important, distinct ways. But they'll say, well, why don't we just make water look like electric? And now all of a sudden these other standards are going to come in. And so you really don't have the choice, right? So there is this kind of preemptive, like if we take care of our own, there's no need for regulatory action. However, like at what point does that become a real risk? And I think that these are these are some of the modern problems that uh, water utility managers have to grapple with and saying, do I, am I going to be that final, that first domino that kicks off, you know, a true regulatory effort in that space and you know, to introduce required standards. I don't know, Kevin, do, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, um, the, 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 the standards that are out there, like I was talking about the AWWA ones, uh, they are not required. They are recommended, but not required. Yeah. So um, I'm currently updating the J100 right now, trying to put more things in there focused on cybersecurity, as well as ways for companies to easily assess these things yeah. and actually put numbers to it. Because if you're looking at, if I get hit with ransomware and the system gets taken offline, what is it going to cost me to recover? And so you put a price tag on it, even if it's a small water utility or a small organization, you put a price tag on it of like $100,000. Now, Ian, you know that $100,000 for a, a ransom re ransomware recovery is, is nothing. I mean, odds are it's going to be much higher, but you put a number of 100,000 in there and you say, or, you can create a backup of that system and have a plan for how to restore that. Yeah. And you could put something in place, work with your IT guys. Yeah. And if you have to hire someone outside, it might cost you five grand. And I had a city go, Kevin, it wasn't five grand. It cost us $35,000. I go, $35,000, what did you do? Oh, we're completely upgrading yeah. our server and all of our engineering laptops and all of our computers and that's why it's costing us 35,000 and I go okay 35,000 mm -hmm. versus removing a hundred thousand dollars in risk annual risk and they go oh yeah it's still still a great yeah. deal well so, I mean it, and it gets down to <clears throat> there's there's I, I thought your financial infrastructure discussion was really interesting because I, I think that this is something that all sides of utilities face. So the, the capital constraints and O&M constraints that um, utilities face. So if it has to do with like subscriptions, personnel, the day-to-day -day stuff, the O&M, that goes directly onto customer bills. So what, what I'll tell you is at og &E, we are incredibly sensitive to the customer bill. Right, and we have very clear, you know, guidance from leadership that we need to protect the customer bill. It's really important for us to keep that low, and so we're challenged to find solutions that don't necessarily have, you know, negative O and M impact. And yeah. so, but things like rate cases, things like, uh, you know, you know, I know the city council for the city of Oklahoma City approved a, a rate hike a few years ago, probably four or five years ago, and that money went direct to infrastructure upgrades, cybersecurity upgrades. Like what utilities really need is support. And I think like reach out to your corporation commission, reach out to your city council, say, hey, this stuff is important. Um, you know, the city of Norman had a, um, a, a breach, not necessarily of their uh, control system, but of their uh, billing system. And so customer utility billing was exposed. And frankly, it's that announcement was made and then it went into a black hole, right? So no one's talking about it anymore. So I... What, what is required is continuous sunlight on these problems and forcing leaders to discuss and say, okay, like, you know, how are we going to defend against this? How are we going to recover? Because at the end of the day, politicians and city management still have to make this decision of like, okay, do I add another public safety officer or do I spend this money on a blinking box or doing something that may or may not happen? You know, politically speaking, it's always good to add public public safety. And I know our public safety departments really need additional manpower as well. So what are the, like, that's the nice thing I like about required standards is you don't really have a choice at that point. Well, the reason why they most likely will never be required is if you're looking at NERC SIP, 
Yeah. You get an outage, it affects other communities around you. It can. Okay. Yeah. You take a look at the, the you know, the cascading blackout uh, around the Great Lakes. Um, when you look at water, you are affecting only one small water system. What happens yeah. there isn't going to happen on another water system that's right next door. Yeah, that's right. Well, and actually, if you really look at NERC, uh, NERC only applies to what's called the bulk electric system. It does not refer to the distribution management system. So this the grid right. that connects to your house is actually not covered by the regulatory authority right. of NERC. It's just the big, tall uh, transmission lines and the big, large power plants. That, re that represents... And we can get into the nuance of that, but yeah. no, I agree, right? Like water is far more a distributed resource than, um, you know, if we're comparing the utilities. Gentlemen, um, I'd like to jump in here. I'm sorry. You, yeah. It's a great dialogue. And yeah, I, sorry. I really appreciate <laughs> it. But we've got one comment on the chat and one question yeah. that I want to get to. Okay. Holly Edwards wrote that Homeland Security uh, grant cycle has just opened. It's a huge initiative on cybersecurity. Local or small systems would have to apply through the state. So that's great information. Thank you, Polly. Yeah, there, there's $1.9 billion that just got released. Um, so that is an open cycle right now. And if you are in a rural area or a tribal area, odds are significantly higher that you will get the funding that you're looking for, including for cybersecurity. Thank you, Kevin. That's that's good information. And this next question is for you. Um, also, well, let me follow it up. Stephanie asks, what state agency do they apply through for that Homeland Security grant? Uh, that I'm not sure. I will. I will have to find out, and I'll. I'll let uh, Tamara know. Okay. Thank you. We'll get uh, back with you. Polly, um, Polly says Polly's. Oklahoma Ho Homeland yeah. Security. Probably. I would assume it would be Oklahoma Office of Homeland Security, but let's. You don't want to make an assumption, right? You know how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> so the question, the final question that we have for today is Homeland. Uh, um, how prevalent are the remote access systems that were compromised at Old Smar? And how do you typically recommend that organizations protect such systems? Kevin? So at, at Oldsmar, um, the credentials was one thing that was compromised. So there's a website that's out there called www.haveibeenpwned.com. And so the credentials for that person, their username and password was for sale on the dark web and had been for some time. So that's what was used in this particular incident. So routinely changing your password, you know, you hear IT say it, hey, that's a good thing to do, you know, every 90 days at least. Uh, when it comes to the OT side, I have seen people go, I've got my same password that I've had for 20 years. And I go, what is it? He goes, enter. And I go, the word enter? And he goes, no, just push the enter key. It's null. And I was like, wow, okay. Um, so but you know what's crazy is that's actually more secure than some of the other passwords because no uh, hash crackers are looking for a null entry. Well, uh, <laughs> okay, but is that good? Is that good practice, though? No, of course okay, not. We'd all agree that it's an interesting component of the the cracking. But yeah, yeah and Oldsmar also had all, all their systems were running Windows Seven, which Ian could probably tell you is is not the best thing to continue running because it's out of date. But again, it's resources having those resources. The guy who was IT for the water sector was also. IT for the, the uh, wastewater sector was also IT for the city, but his day job was be the city manager. Okay, so all those IT skills were just side little things. Um, and one way to secure those systems, if you are doing remote access, is you look at multi-factor authentication. There are ways out there and there are companies that produce a simple solution for $5 per month per user for multi-factor authentication. That's if you go sign in your username and your password, boom, it puts a pin to your smartphone and say, yes, allow this access. If they would have had that, their system would have been secured. 
Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Ian, so much for your time today. We are out of time. We're right at 11 o'clock. I want to be respectful of everyone's one hour time frame. Thank you again so much, everyone. Thanks to our presenters. I'm going to give a virtual applause. It was a very interesting dialogue, and I really appreciate it. We'll, we'll be doing more of this in the future. Um, thank you for your time. On behalf of the Oklahoma Environmental Training Center, we appreciate you being here and hope you have a fantastic remainder of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Have a wonderful day. Be safe.